Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, wherever you are in the world, whether you're from Brussels or wherever. Welcome to the EV Cafe. So it's our 18th episode, and this week is a very special one for all of us because we get to announce and celebrate for being shortlisted for the IT Innovation Award by Greenfleet. So a round of applause for every EV Cafe, because without you lot, our beloved EV Cafe crowd, special guests, everyone that's yeah. involved, we wouldn't be able to do this. And we absolutely love uh, EV Cafe Week. So a, a round of applause. Hey, just me, is it? <laughs> uh, for those of you, quite rightly, as James has just highlighted, that are new to us and that have clicked the link, registered and joined, to the, joined on today and, and uh, want to know what they have signed up for for the next couple of hours. Well, who you see on the screen are our sofa panellists, and we ask five special guests to present to us, and of course you and our lovely, lovely audience. But as, uh, as we've already mentioned, we aren't like your traditional webinar, as we only give uh, our presenters five minutes airtime for the sole purpose to educate in a light-hearted way, whilst the rest of the time is spent involving you lot as the EV Cafe crowd in the discussion and more importantly, answering your questions um, in the mailroom sections of the show, which is hosted by the lovely John Curtis. So do sit back, grab a coffee and, and enjoy the next uh, couple of hours. They fly by. Um, and as we've, as we've all seen, especially through lockdown one and lockdown two, there's been plenty of webinars recently. But now we feel it's time to mix it up even more. It's time for a fight, a contest. It's time for power play. So we have two contestants going head to head, Mr. Paul Kirby, uh, fast and slow, and then Mr. Sam Clark, who's all about ultra fast rapid charging across super hubs across the UK. So where do we charge? How do we charge? And how will we charge them in the future? These are all the questions that we will challenge our contestants throughout today's session. So Paul and Sam, where was the EV Cafe crowd? Are you in the red corner and rooting for Sam Clark and believe all charging should be as fast as possible and ultimately rely on public charging? Uh, are you in the blue corner with Paul Kirby and believe it should be a blend of super fast, fast and slow, depending upon your resources and needs? So as I mentioned, they are our main contestants for today, but we will also see guests weighing in to present their view on the right infrastructure for EV charging. These will include people from Hitachi ABB Power Grids, the RAC, Zoom EV, and of course our very own Sam Clark from GridServe. Um, so John Curtis, he will be chatting to the audience. So come up ringside and contribute to the fight. And what I mean by that is please ask, ask our audience and panelists questions, chat in the mailbox and raise your virtual hand to, to come off mute if you're feeling brave enough. Um, Sarah Sloman will take on the responsibility of being the referee today and ultimately keeping an eye on the times of each round, ensuring our special guests do not exceed their five minute slot. And as I said before, Sam and Paul will be toe to toe, nose to nose, and Matt and I will be keeping them all in check in the medical bay. But before we hear from these industry experts and ask them all fantastic questions via the panel on your behalf, we have some digital virtual housekeeping for anybody that's new to the cafe today. I just want to reiterate the most important thing. Uh, and as I previously said, the EV cafe is not like your traditional webinar. It's all about you lot as the participants that it is about us. And it's all about educating, talking to you and answering questions. And we would always love to hear from you. So to begin with, if you don't mind, could you please share who you are and where you're from using the chat box, then, then we would really appreciate it so we know who our audience are. And please do feel free to chat amongst yourself or to the panel using this. However, if you do find it distracting during some of the talks or presentations, because we've got some excellent special guests today, then feel free to close or ignore it. Keep an eye out for any polls, um, as John Curtis likes a good poll. Um, make sure you answer them as this will remove it from your screen. However, this is your chance to speak to people you might not have come across before, maybe you might not cross paths with. So please do, do give this as an opportunity to ask some questions, whatever you would like. And if you're feeling brave enough, again, please raise your virtual hand and I'll take you off mute. 
please make sure that all questions go in the Q&A tab. And uh, of course, we'll endeavor to answer those questions as soon as we can, either in the chat box live or ideally in the mailroom section of the show, which again, as I said to you before, is hosted by uh, John Curtis. But uh, be nice, be kind, no silly comments. And Paul and Sam, let's make it a clean fight. Uh, <laughs> no, Jonathan, you just say no silly comments. <laughs> <laughs> so Paul, you might as well just stay on you. <laughs> um, and uh, so yeah, so and uh, no silly comments from the audience as well. Whereas John Curtis, who doubles up as a as cafe security. Uh, the, the, the final rule, really, and this, this is for the panel and any special guests joining us today, um, I just kindly ask that we just raise our hand uh, on camera like so, um, if you want to talk. This is just simply to avoid crossing over each other, like being back at school, um, especially when we have a dozen or so on, on, on at any one time. So let's get to, down to business. So who are the cafe crew? Hopefully you know who I am by now, but it's just, doesn't, just in case you don't, um, I'm the head barista of today. My name is Johnny Berry. Um, my day job is working for Fleet Sales Department for Rally UK, supporting uh, EV adoption anywhere that I can. And I'm always eager to engage with you lot from EV Cafe, offline, LinkedIn, you name it. And the awesome bunch, the awesome uh, people that are involved in EV Cafe like me, who help this ha make this happen um, every episode, who are otherwise known as the Avengers, um, are the people that you see on the screen. So would you like to introduce yourselves, guys? Sarah, would you like to start? Oh, why not? Thank you ever so much for that kind introduction. So I'm Sarah Sloman. I work for Foot Anstey, which is a law firm, and I'm in the energy and infrastructure team. So today is proper business. What should we be planning for the future? How do we get our developers to listen to us? What does the end consumer want? And I'm in charge of this very passive aggressive chalkboard so I'll be keeping score along the way and anybody who steps out of line will suffer the wrath of the slowminator. <laughs> uh, Paul you're next on the screen. Why do I always have to follow the articulate <laughs> and You're not really, you're the upper end. So not fair. <laughs> So, I am hashtag van geek. I love vans and I celebrate all things electric vans and the transition to electric vans. Um, that's my, my purpose in life. The company I work for, Vanarama, uh, clues in the name. Um, we are electrifying the, uh, the fleets out there and trying to help people make good decisions about vehicles, but also about infrastructure. Uh, and that's uh, and I also champion, of course, mental health, being a mental health first aid trained person by the wonderful St. John's Ambulance. Thank you to them. Um, and so, you know, many, many times people have come on the cafe not feeling uh, themselves and gone away feeling a little bit encouraged. Don't be afraid to say I'm not feeling my best today. Um, you know, Sam, no doubt, is, is full of anxiety and anxiousness today. <laughs> Um, you know, coming up against the ma ma mighty Van Geek. Um, so do share, please, on a serious note. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're here to support one another. Thanks, Paul. Uh, very important, that is. Um, John. Hello, I'm John Curtis. I'm a Go Ultra Low ambassador. I've been the head of sustainable transport for Scotland. Uh, and I am into marketing of all things sustainable. So looking after our resources, looking after each other, which Paul's mentioned and mental health and all that kind of stuff. And I just want to see a massive punch up today. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks John. To Over to you, Sam. Over to me. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, uh, Johnny, you've already given, you've already teamed up with Paul a little bit because I don't necessarily agree with completely high power charging. And, and I shall explain my points on this very clearly later. Um, but, you know, I've, uh, I'm, I'm reasonably new to electric vehicles. I've only been driving them for 15 years. So, um, uh, uh. Um, and charging them in fact, throughout that whole time and also building a company of my own, which ran a huge fleet of electric vehicles. So I am reasonably, reasonably well known in terms of using electric vehicles. I tell everyone every time I introduce this time. Um, but I'm uh, yeah, very keen and looking forward to having a debate with, with my good friend, Paul Kirby about, about what, uh, what real world looks like. He needs a good education and, uh, and uh, looking forward to uh, debating this with you all um, and uh, seeing where it goes. Lovely. And then last but not least, my northern counterpart, Matthew Kizia. As he said, I'm his northern counterpart. Same <laughs> as Johnny, but up north. <laughs> Here to enjoy us in there. 
Hopefully we have a good day today. I'm looking forward to this fight. I've been looking forward to this one since it was announced. <laughs> Got ringside seats as well, Matt. Um, so I guess now it's time to get your stopwatch out, referee Sarah Sloman. Um, as the first presenter is actually one of our own. Mr. None other than Mr. Paul Kirby. John, I think you should do the honours of introducing Paul. I think you've got this. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let's get ready to rumble. In the blue corner and weighing in at three stone and one pound, wet through, it is the legend that is Paul the Van Geek. Kirby! Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Golly gosh. I think it's a bit more than three stone. If anyone's <laughs> joining the webinar now, they're thinking, what's going on? Over to you, Paul. And Sarah, if you right, want to keep sorry. an eye on his time to ensure that he doesn't exceed five minutes, he said. Uh, Right, so hopefully you can all see my screen. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, good stuff. So, um, oh, is it working? Oh, dear. Yeah, yeah, we can see it. Ah, there yeah. we go. Okay, we're moving on. So um, this is uh, the power play with me and Sam discussing our mildly differing views. So, you know, we're in danger of being in violent agreement on many things, um, but there are some... <laughs> different things and and you know it is all about the fast and furious versus the slow and steady and the options today that we've got are the home and workplace plus destination style four courts only which is what sam clark is putting his uh, uh stake in the ground on and what i'm suggesting is a wider uh solution which yes it accepts that uh, four courts um have their place and are very good but we also want to have um, that local and, oh gosh, sorry, I've just uh, made the chat box too big, um, and local and diverse local EVSE infrastructure. Nobody helped caught me up on EVSE. Gosh, I, it's electric vehicle supply equipment is what it stands for. So no acronyms beyond this point, please. Um, so facts to consider. There are 4.1 million vans on the world and 30, or in, in the UK, um, and 31.6 million cars. That's 35 million vehicles that we've got to change. Uh, they are currently changing at around 2 to 2.5 million vehicles a year, but only a small percentage of those are electric. The average age of a van or car in the UK is sort of slightly higher for vans and slightly lower for cars, but is 7.8 years. So it's quite a lot. Um, they're not young. They're not the, the uh, spring chickens and highest um, tech. The fastest growing according to the RAC is the vans. The van sector is growing um, and has grown massively over the last few years uh, and accounts for 16% of the traffic on the road whilst only accounting for one in 10 of the actual numbers. But they're still not in use for around 14 hours a day where this will come, become important. Um, Cars are stationary for 95% of their life, according to various uh, studies. Um, and circa 40 to 60% of people, depending on who you listen to, don't have the ability to charge at home. And also it is reported that high-speed charging increases degradation on batteries, potentially. Although the evidence on that, I, I don't have it, but I've heard that. So maybe I'm wrong. So what are the questions? Well, where... When, how will we charge now and in the future? So we've got to do something that is good for today, but also good for tomorrow as well. We can't just do something that solves the problem today because we don't have um, very many relatively electric vehicles on the market. Do we look at the old way and just repeat it? You know, lots of big charging stations all over the place. Or do we take advantage of the fact that we can innovate and transform the way we power our vehicles? Um, we have got to ask the question how important is speed versus the location and time when we're doing things. We've also got to ask the question, what does innovation look like? What does actually doing something different look like? And also, of course, when we're investing in the, the big forecourts and all those kinds of things, can we make them sustainable from a business model perspective? But also, you could also say sustainable for people to use and utilize. Is it cost effective? for the man on the street, the common man, as I put him earlier. So things against a single solution, the charging speed. Well, you know, 
uh, you know, a 350 kilowatt charger will power a Tycan for about five minutes on the on its, you know, what is this curve thing? And bear in mind, I'm a layman here. They've got charging curves and bell curves and this curve and that curve. It doesn't charge at 350 kilowatts all the time, nor does a 50 kilowatt charger into a 50 kilowatt um, vehicle, a vehicle that's able to receive uh, 50 kilowatts. Also, the cost of charging. Great, thanks, Johnny. Uh, perfectly timed, get out of the way. Uh, um, sorry, Paul. <laughs> got 30 um, seconds left, Mr. What? Kirby. Wow. The TCO model, it doesn't work at 30 pence a kilowatt. It doesn't work at those much because that wipes out the benefit. Um, journey time to the to and from a single solution, not good. 63 different CASs all over the country, all coming up with different plans. And a ULES um, where, you know, large cities are excluding uh, infrastructure from, oh gosh, get out of here, putting the pressure on me. Um, so the solution. Charging when all vehicles are not in use. Um, public infrastructure curbside built into new estates. Uh, Swindon is a great example of building it into a new estate. Electrified car parks. Really? Yes. I spoke to somebody else just this morning that is doing this in London. They are electrifying a whole car park. Uh, park and ride schemes. It makes sense when vehicles are stationary. Rural fast 7 to 22 kilowatt multiple charging units. Electrifying car parks like the one in my mum's home in the village yeah <laughs> nobody listens to you sam clark uh four courts here's your bit sam this is important <laughs> commercial trunking etc it's good to be able to charge quickly on route but vehicles don't accept charge quickly which is a challenge to the oems mm -hmm. new strategic mini networks building up around uh, maybe hotel networks and, and other things that are doing plug sharing signpost lighting and simple Signposting, lighting, and simple cost models. The end. And there goes Sam Clark. <laughs> end of round one. Yeah, brilliant. So I lost the point, but it was worth it. How, uh, you didn't how... lose a point because you were making a brilliantly valid point, Paul Kirby. And besides, not everyone can afford oh, super rapid charging at their place. That's, that's a massive point. After listening to you, um, Paul, you can see the poll results. Uh, in front of your screen now. So um, I, will, I will launch them again after Sam, see if these numbers change. What do you reckon? Does he get a point, point, everyone? Stay in the chat box while Sam's warming up, limbering yeah. up, flexing I those need, muscles. I don't need to limber up. Plus the fact he went over by about two minutes. So no, literally, <laughs> yeah, that did happen. One, one minute, one minute. See if you can come back from point. that, Sam. 91%. You, Sam, you haven't got much to talk about, so you can do it in five minutes. Right, you're on, Sam. Are you, you are, mate. Gladiator, are you ready? <laughs> are you ready? Uh, are you ready, ready? Uh, Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm a, Do you need to share your screen? Yeah, I'm doing it now. I'm doing it now. Um, I have to say, a lot of love for Paul in the uh, chat box. Got to say yeah. that. A lot of yeah, love. He definitely gets a point. I've put a point on the board. Yeah. Got to be a knockout now, Sam. Well, I w okay. Am I starting? Are you ready? Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Um, so a couple of things. Presentation is great. Paul, well done as always. And I agree with you that, um, that we agree with a lot of points. And, and if, if I ever want to see anyone sit on the fence, um, uh, then you're my, you're my man. Um, uh, so uh, sorry, people are opening the doors in this very busy electric car I'm currently sat in, just FYI. Um, right, moving on. So um, EV charging. I do agree with Paul on a lot of topics and I will not win the poll because the poll uh, actually, I agree uh, as with the uh, with the ninety percent because there is a, there is a mix required. You know, we do have to charge at home. It's very very important. I'm not saying that we shouldn't. I really really do believe that home charging is is useful. Um, and I'm not going to go on the statistics because Paul's already done it. Uh, workplace charging is already also incredibly important. Uh, although there is only two thirds of the country that drive to work, and only five percent of that two thirds can actually charge at work at the moment. So that needs to be improved. But I totally subscribe to the logic that the cheapest and most convenient places are scenarios such as these. However, there is a third option, which again, Paul doesn't mention, which is public charging. Um, what we don't need is impractical on-street charging. We don't need unreliable rapid charging, and we don't need sporadic and inaccessible charging. I am here to present the real world scenario, not the one where you just go over fluffy, we want, it'd be really nice to have this. We've got to get down to the basics of what really matters to electrify the nation. Um, so we do need dependable, available, reliable, and high-powered. Um, here's some examples of where I've suffered unreliability just in the last few weeks or a couple of months. You know, chargers that aren't working, it's not good enough. 
Uh, what is good is oversubscribed. There's too many vehicles at the same locations trying to charge at the precise time when you need it. And the inaccessibility. I don't want to park in flower beds. I don't want to park in cycle lanes. And I don't want to drive down one way street to the runway to plug in a BMW i3. You know, what we have, some of it is rubbish, some of it is oversubscribed, and some of it's inaccessible. None of that is going to be a solution for the future. Um, and, you know, if you don't believe me, then take this guy's word for it. He loves to hang out in public toilets for some reason. I don't know why. Um, but this is him procrastinating about being in the middle of nowhere with a charger that's not working. Um, <laughs> and, then there's, and there's this guy who's stuck in a car park where the pin is in the wrong place on the map, and he can't even see the charger because it's behind a tree or a <laughs> Or a, you know, so this guy's quite useful at, at, at supporting my argument. Um, and as far as on-street charging is concerned, you know, massive, massive challenge. The demographic of people wanting to use this sort of stuff is really, really varied. The idea of putting a few chargers for 60, 70 cars on a street just isn't practical. It's not going to work. Similarly, lamppost charging has the same challenge. There just aren't enough to make it a real-world solution. The only way to appease that many people with that many vehicles is to have a charger at every single parking bay. You can't do that because it's too expensive. And you can't do that for lampposts because there's never going to be enough of them to support the infrastructure. It sounds great, but it just isn't practical. Um, and again, this guy, he's massively doing me a favor by demonstrating the potential of street charging on a particular street. Which street did he choose? He chose the one with one lamppost and one car on it. Now, on earth, that, <laughs> how on earth is that a good example of where to put street charging? There's plenty of parking, there's no cars on the street, and there's no lampposts, and there's loads of driveways, therefore negating the whole point in the first place, but just, just saying. But anyway, maybe this would be a better example, Paul, to use. No, maybe not that one. That's not a great example, is it? No, neither, neither is that one. Bedford. Actually, no, no, that one's not, that's not a very good example either. So, oh, there we go. There, there's a good one. So there's a street where actually I would warrant that you need to put your, your video and say, look, we're in this lovely street in London and it's got loads of lampposts and loads of parking. Look how it's working beautifully. It, it, just, it, just, it just doesn't work. There's too many ice cars in the way for a start. So we need to have practical solutions to the future proof. One is charging at home, simple, effective, cheap. The other is charging at a destination like a workplace, affordable, cheap, and good for the business. And the third one is proper infrastructure. And yes, I'm biased in this bit, because of where I'm currently sat in a meeting pod, surrounded by beautiful cars, high power charging, I'm, I'm at that location and it is absolutely fantastic. This is the kind of thing we need because it solves the problem that equates to a service station and a petrol station solution. Multiple chargers, reliable, fast, and can and more future-proof. One of Paul's comments was around the cars. Yes, they charge fast and they charge fast today. State of charge, curving, charge curves, and the, and the limitations of the vehicles are still there, but every single iteration gets faster and more powerful. So we'll be able to charge quicker and quicker and quicker. And this is the kind of solution that we need. Anything in between is wasting valuable money, valuable time, and is not gonna solve the problem that we have in fleets or, or vehicle electrification across the country. So I'm a bit forthright. I do think we need to simplify the solutions and the infrastructure needs to be right for the masses. We are only just ticking a 1% percentage of vehicles on the road that are electric. We've got 99% to try to support over the next decade or so. It's not gonna work with some of the scenarios I've raised. It will work in these ones. And that, I think, is me done. How did I do? Very well. I would I would like to point out that although grid serve and other rapid charging facilities soon will become available, there is a lag time to meet and it's very quick to deploy destination charging and low power charging and affordable too. So I would like to award you a point, one for your beautiful grid serve and wonderful presentation, but also I'm going to say one for the low blows because man that made us laugh. <laughs> 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 okay, so we're currently at two one. So just just as a bit of fun, um, I've launched a poll to say who do you think won that round out of Sam and Paul, and Sam is taking a bit of a lead at the moment. So I'll leave that running for the next thirty seconds. Um, we we have someone brave enough um, has actually raised their virtual legal. hand. Oh, I recognise his name, uh -oh. Joel Teague. He's been on before and he's talking from, I believe, uh, as a co charger app. Shall we have him on? Should we have him on for one minute? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. So time time him, please, sir, referee, and we'll give Joel one minute of air time. If you, if, so, hello, Joel. I, I would say welcome to BB Cafe, but you've been here before, so welcome back. Thank you. Right, one minute. Okay, actually, this agrees with both of our fine pugilists. You've both made a very important point. 
Uh, first on the importance of being able to charge while that vehicle is not being used. And I believe also the point about the 56% of people who can't charge at home. Yes, this is gonna involve my own company, but then it is very important. Um, there are over 300,000 home chargers. Um, make them available. If every van driver in this country could start their day with a full battery, it completely changes the landscape of what we need in terms of charging out there on the, the roads and makes it quicker and makes it cheaper and it means we can actually solve the problem. So I've just pointed out, yes, I'm talking on behalf of co-charger because that's what we do. We make those home chargers available to everybody. I think we need to start including that consideration in our modeling. We've been talking to the REA and SMMT and others, and they are starting to change their models to allow for that. I think it's really important. It's gonna be a massive part of the landscape, so. Well, that's still, right. did you say 300,000? Yeah, I mean, just look at the number of EVs out there and almost all of them, uh, all but I think 8% have a home charger. Oh, so that 300,000 isn't official, it's just an extrapolation of other it's data. It's an extrapolation, but we've got well over 300,000. I can't deal in extrapolations, Joel. Well, there you go. It's that. more than that. It's probably closer to half a million now, but, you know, it's, enough. Point taken, it's about though. Point 10 taken. times as many as we need to power all the vans, at least at the start of their day. We then need both of what our pugilists are talking about as well. You can't do this with just public infrastructure. Thanks, Joel. Agreed. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. What were the results of that poll, JB? I didn't quite uh, So, yeah, it was a win, win on your behalf there, Sam. So, referee, please give Sam a point. Um, I've already given him two points. What were, the, what were the scores? I think you were in the, about 60-odd percent there, Sam. 66, I think it was, actually. <laughs> yeah. So, which so is, Paul, you had thirds. your hand up. Yeah, I did. Um, it was, and just to say, it was the other way around, 91 versus 9 at the moment. So the, the point I was making is easy to take pot shots at what we currently have. You know, I, I, and you've correctly reported on the videos that I've, I've put out there because absolutely it is not good enough where we're at. And we will absolutely fall flat on our face if we try and rely on what is there today. But the reality is if we want to look after the common man and give mass adoption, to the second life of vans, to the second life of cars, the average age being 7.8 years. And yes, iterations of, of new vehicles will have faster charging and all of that good stuff. Um, but the common man, the typical person driving a vehicle needs to have accessible charging at a sensible speed that they can you know, charge it in the times that they have. And they don't have time to go or, or cost time or cost, the, the, the time or money to go and charge at destination points. They need to charge when the vehicle's not, not being used. So give me an example. Uh, give me, give me a John respect. Smith example of that. So, well, if somebody buys a vehicle secondhand, um, they are, they're, they're a typical tradesman, for instance, they're, they're buying a four-year-old Vito that's electric or whatever they're buying. It has seven kilowatt charger only currently, um, and uh, they they need to charge it overnight when they're at home because the cost of the electric, if it if it stays the same, and bear in mind the cost model is going to change <coughs> dramatically because today fuel is eighty percent um, tax. Mm. So what's going to happen to that in the future? As we stand today, if you charge thirty p or beyond, and a lot of proponents are 30, 35, 39, 69 some. Um, that defeats the whole total cost of ownership model. And you don't want to have to go and sit somewhere and, and go shopping yeah, in a high-end supermarket yeah. or whatever it might be. Thanks, Paul. John, you've got your, your hand patiently waiting there. My sticky little paw has been in the air. Here's the reason why. The on-street residential charging scheme allows councils to apply for 75% of the funding to install on-street charging yet the AA has found that only one in six councils have applied for that funding why is that is that because they just can't be bothered or is no. it that Sam's right it's because it's it doesn't because... sorry Sarah it's, just, it's because it doesn't work it's not practical you know and I think can I just go back to Paul's point just a quick just quickly I, I think let, let, I think we should move one thing out of the way that I think we both agree that home charging and <laughs> workplace charging is a good is a good idea right? absolutely so so your example the reason I was I was I was trying to press you because 
let's, let's just part the fact that you've got a van whose parts on his driveway, because we both agree that's right. It's, it's what he does in the outside world, in the public domain, where he does not have on that his access. driveway. Not on his driveway. Well, he, no, the, 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 the person that hasn't got one, yeah, that hasn't got a driveway. Because yeah. we all agree that driveways are a good thing. I'm not saying yeah. it isn't. But if he hasn't got a driveway, what's he going to do? And that's the scenario where what we have now doesn't work very well. And if we keep replicating what we have now, that's not going to help the, the, the guy with the van. It's just not going to help him mm. because the other guy with the van is going to want to use the same 50 kilowatt charger tucked behind a hotel. It's just not practical. But the average, the average journey is only 30 miles for these guys. For the guys that are taking the second life of the vehicle and are tradesmen, they're working in their localities and they're often doing around 30 to 50 miles. So one charge will do them two or three days. All, all the better um, to go to a forecourt and do it where they know they can definitely fill up to full rather than taking a risk of trying to drive around unreliable. That last, percent, that last 20% takes forever. And somebody, um, it was Shell that reported this morning that they believe that a vehicle can be charged from zero to, 50, zero to 80 in 30 minutes okay. with a 50 kilowatt charger. This is the kind of misinformation that shouldn't yeah. be out there. That's not Agreed. the right way to be char to right. promoting these things. Just, and we yeah. need a realistic option, yeah. which is yeah. steady charging overnight. On that note, Paul, um, about real world stuff, real um, realistic uh, charging times, return of range and all that kind of stuff. I think I feel like I need to talk from my own experience and give you some tips that I've learned. Not as uh, uh, experienced as Sam Clark, but I've certainly done... I'm coming up to seven years <laughs> driving EVs, um, but not quite 15 years. You've but I would like to just give you some top tips of what I think that I've learned over that time uh, and what you can do if you want to go EV now rather than what is the best thing to do, but what you can do right now if you want to go EV. So I, I, I'm just going to uh, ramble on for two minutes. I don't know if you want to time me, Sarah, but I, I feel like we need to do this. Um, and then I'm going to defend are... local authorities after you've gone, definitely. <laughs> Oh, sorry. So, sorry, I cut you off. so there is, as you said, Paul, there is a large portion of people that don't have a drive. So what I say to you, and this is from my own experience of driving a Renault Zoe in the last um, uh, uh, 12 months as Eddie 50, is do your research, do your research, do your research and educate. Because if you think about where you park your car now, maybe you're walking distance to a destination, maybe you visit the gym, maybe you go for a walk and it happens to be next to a rapid charge, it's your favourite walking spot. Um, I would always say just check out that map, work out how much time you need and how much it will cost you as well. Um, it might just encourage you to get some fresh air for a bit and exercise a bit more often. It's not such a bad thing, but it, it can be done because I'm just saying from my experience, I've done several thousands of thousand miles this year. Not, not, not my normal. Um, obviously, with lockdown, usually it's well in excess of 20,000 miles. But, it, but the seven, several thousand that I've done, it's actually closer to the average person. And I have plugged into my home charger once in that time. Um, and the reasons being is because I have got uh, short arms and long pockets and Renault pay for my Polar subscription account. And because I have the range in the Zoe now of 250 odd miles subject to weather and how I drive it and everything else, I only actually need to plug into a rapid or uh, once every, this particular rapid once every 10 or so days. Um, and I always go to this particular spot anyway. It's on the beach and I go for a, a, an hour walk. Um, so out of the 10 days that I go for the walk, I only need to plug in once and there are two choices of rapids. So it does actually work for me. And every time I go to the shops, I come back with more range because this Tesco's around a corner and it's a destination. But I appreciate not everyone is like me, but you could make it work, but it does involve a lot of education at the moment uh, and a real understanding. Whereas uh, if I'm doing a longer journey and I, and, and I don't drive a Tesla, I drive a Renault Zoe, uh, before any trip, I would say get used to the vehicle, understand it, understand that it will do a less range than you're normally used to on a longer journey because you're at higher speeds and you can keep the battery faster. If you don't mind going a bit slower and you're keeping eco, you will certainly get to your destination faster as you'll spend less time on a charge point potentially. Also know how your vehicle reacts in the weather. A lot of people probably bought since the, you know, the, the, the benefit in kind and actually haven't been to the extremes of the weather. So you've probably had the best of the range um, and, and you understand that uh, batteries perform differently in, in colder climates, less efficiently with the electrons. Um, and also understand, as, as Paul rightly said, realistically, what you can get back on your charge on AC, DC, it doesn't exist anymore, half an hour to 80%. Battery, batteries are all over the place in different sizes, cars charging right. different rates and everything else. Uh, 
I'm not going for this job. I don't have a big enough. It's like slot you just ignored Sarah. I can't believe it. How rude. Sorry, I, I sorry. So you have to butt in because I've just been in my zone. But what I was going to say is, um, when you're Shut thinking about that long oh, journey, the last anyway. thing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Johnny. Oh, thanks, Johnny. Right. Sarah, Sarah, yeah. you are next. Can I Sarah. have 30 seconds? Can I just have no, 30 seconds? Two and a half minutes. You've had, three, three, you've had two and a half minutes. Get out of here. Three and a half minutes. You've had three and a half minutes. Yeah. All, all, all I want to say. Everybody has been slamming local authorities about this 75% and it's really not fair because when that funding came out, it wasn't possible to suddenly conjure up the additional 25. Now, some people have been very clever with that, but people were already on the OLED pathway, go to low west or had already allocated their funding for capital and revenue projects for the next three, four years. So this isn't, this isn't about don't hate the player, hate the game scenario. This is about the fact that you can't just magic money in local authority, but we need to help people to get there because as much as we love it, or maybe not, on street charging does have its place if done correctly, if planned well. Look at Brighton and Hove, fantastic project there. London's done some streets well, others, mm. but we have got to get to a point where we're helping people. I know we're playing, I know we're fighting, but it's about helping people. So I've loved it and loving this, loving this debate. Let's remind ourselves we're two one here. So let's get back to the agenda and our guest speakers and maybe Sam, we'll see what they've got to say. You've got your hand up and then over to John just to go to the mailroom section of the show. So I've got I've got one minute of uh, no I haven't I've got one comment about your uh, three and a half minutes and that is to say that it breaks my heart to disagree with you Johnny but your example completely ignores the fact that you are in the one percent market of, of battery electric vehicle drivers on the road today so your example of using the car once a week going for a walk is all fine because the access to charging is because you've only got one percent yeah of the other of the, the total registration of vehicles on the road to to fight for over that charger we've only got to tip that scale just a little bit more and every time you want to do that little top up when you go for a walk it's not going to happen because somebody else is going to be wanting to use the same charger as you exactly yeah but i will say this one other thing on that sam is that over the six years i didn't have any rapid chargers anywhere immediately local to me i had the closest one was an eco tricity to me so even though there is a, a slow uptake, so to speak, um, th there's certainly an increase I'm seeing locally, different charges at all different places. Um, so I just so hope that, that that rise at the same pace. Um, and it, it sounds like it is because you're sitting in the in a grid serve. <laughs> I am so indeed. it does sound like it is. The, the, the most, frustrating, the, the most say, frustrating thing with charging is when it doesn't work. The second most frustrating yeah. thing is when you get there and somebody else is there and you've got to wait an yeah. hour. That's what's going to happen if we stick single things all over the place. It's great for you today, but won't be won't be any good for you tomorrow. And Craig's the gonna like this. thing is, it's three times the cost of charging at home or at work, and it need that that's the model that needs to change. And it's not going to change with commercial organisations doing it. It is going to change with local authorities doing it. Okay, we're going to have to put a pause on this uh, discussion. It's a very good discussion, John, but John, we have to go over to the next special guest. John, and... John was going to say something, weren't you, John? No, 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 oh, no. Okay. I, if it, it was mailroom stuff, you know, oh, okay. just, you know down so, in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll get to the mailroom shortly after our next guest. So, um, John, would you like to go ahead and make an introduction to James John Louis in your famous fashion? Ladies and gentlemen, we are now joined. Oh, lords, ladies and gentlemen, I should say, we are now joined by the wonderful James John Louis. Is that all right? pretty good thank you <laughs> james are you there i am indeed guys um i, I i'm not able to um start my video because i think you've blocked my video but uh, yeah, james. <laughs> best that way. That the plan? <laughs> i'll see if i can sort that but go ahead um and i'll see if i can sort yeah. that in the background so, hi hi everybody yeah my 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 videos um, okay i can start my video now so um i can say are. hi to everyone um welcome james hi, uh, Great to see you all, and great to see. I think it's 223 participants on online as 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 I speak. So my my name is John, James Jean Louis. I'm the uh, chief commercial officer of Zoom EV. Um, my background is actually over 30 years of automotive experience, and particularly in the last 10 years, have been uh, dedicated to the electric car sector. Um, and it. Is he frozen for everybody, or was it just uh, me? Oh, I thought no. it was me. Oh, I'm relieved. Yeah. Oh, he's back. He's back. James, we lost you. You lost me. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. You're back again. Um, yeah. So, 2014, I sold my business to Chargemaster, which, as you all know, is 
No, you've gone, oh. James. Turn the video off, James. Yeah, I'm with so her. So you go to the mailroom, I did say? Yeah. So yeah. over to you, John, in the mailroom whilst he gets himself sorted. But he seems to have dropped out completely now. Alrighty. Let's get so, some questions answered. Yeah, we've got some technical problems there. So we will go to three questions that we have in the question and answer box. And interestingly enough, the three contributors, their surnames all start with the B. They do. How weird is that? So we've got Paul Barnfather and a question for Sam. And, I, and I'm not sure this is directed at you specifically, Sam, but we'll go with it. Why not destination charging? Um, Paul's thinking of things like car parks and retail, not just workplace. What do you think about destination charging? Good thing, bad thing? I think um, I think it's probably a good thing. If it's, I, I would sort of categorise it. It is it is destination charging, but I would sort of categorise it as opportune charging. You know, the scenario where you're going somewhere you don't go that often, or you don't go too often, and you just have a, a useful. Time. Um, the reality of putting putting large scale DC into these sort of locations is very difficult. Yeah, um, the power's not there. It's far too expensive. Um, I think a longer stretch of perhaps seven ACs, uh, seven uh, kilowatt charges in these sort of scenarios would be quite useful so that you, if you're there for a meaningful amount of time, you can add in a meaningful amount of energy um, on the presumption that economic, it's an economically viable application. So I think I, there's nothing wrong with that at all. And, and, and again, you know, I guess I'm sitting on the fence a little bit now, but I, I can't see anything wrong with that. But, but I also struggle with the economic viability. So if it was my pounds and pence as an, as an investor, I'm not sure I'd go down that path because I wouldn't see a return on investment. So I think operationally it sounds great and I wouldn't have necessarily have an issue with it. But again, I, I, I just want to thrash the real world scenario into all of this, whether it be practicality or economic viability. And, and in this particular case, I'm struggling with the economic viability of, of, of the investment in that, but I'm not saying it's a bad idea operationally. Okay, Paul, I'm coming to you. I just want to clarify one thing. AC and DC, just for Sorry. people who may not know, uh, Sam, can you just give us some clarity around what AC charging is and what DC is? Because they're quite different. Sure. So AC is, um, stands for alter, uh, alternative current, alternate current, and DC is direct current. So two different types of power flow. Um, the AC stuff is typically slower charging, um, up to 22 kilowatts, but typically up to seven kilowatts in the, in the domestic environment. Um, mostly because it's a single phase, which is another phrase in terms of the amount of energy that comes into the house. So, so AC is basically slower charging and DC can be anything from around 25 kilowatts all the way up to 350, which is what the future will need. And what you might have at grid surf, I just, I just might be surrounded by 12 of them <clears throat> with another 12 90 kilowatt chargers and another six AC chargers and another six Tesla superchargers, which is the kind of infrastructure that we need in this country. Just Good to see that you're not pushing that one there, mate. Now, Paul, not what have you got to say? Well, I, I think it's really important this this commercial viability bit. Um, I, you know, we'll just say that you know people like Lidl's, uh, McDonald's, uh, Costa, uh, Starbucks, all are, are investing in 125 kilowatt chargers or having in 125 kilowatt chargers at their sites. So you know these become more meaningful, um, and you know you can do different things and. Um, I accept fully that you know what Sam describes is is almost like EV heaven in many many ways. Um, although you can't, the man on the street still has to pay a commercial rate rather than a domestic rate for his charging, and it defeats the the total cost of ownership uh, model to a large extent. And maybe not in grid server. Maybe grid server are going to become the little and Aldi of of charging. That may well be the case, and everybody will flock. To them, but and that's not a that's not a downplay of, of what you do, Sam. Because obviously, what you've done, we've seen it a little bit. It is going to be exceptional, and there's no no question. But you don't want to have to make the journey there and back. You don't want to have to pay a commercial rate. You don't want to have to wait with a whole bunch of other people. You want to leave your car in the same way you do today, and and it come back to it with it fueled, rather than uh, rather than this sort of destination angle. Why why should we do the same thing that we've always done, and you know go to a service station and spend time there when we can do it by the side of the road with well invested, publicly funded, um, and, and cost neutral uh, infrastructure? Because it won't yeah, work. Fair enough, Paul. Now hang on a second, Matt. You want you've got your hand up. Yeah, I'm going to put a big shout out for Scotland here, I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> and, and I, 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 you know, first, first and foremost, I do, I really like the idea of grid surf, Sam, I really do. 
Um, and I think it's, it is going to be a good, you know, it's going to be a massive part of the future of electric vehicles. Now, I spend a lot of time in Scotland and Dundee is one of those cities that I visit quite regularly. And over the last few years, I've been watching the stuff that's gone on up there. And some of the big innovations that I like up there are firstly the charging hubs that they put in. So they put in charging hubs, but they put those in areas of the city where there was a need for regeneration. And they've actually opened shop units around those charging points. So things like cafes, uh, key cutters, shoe, you know, shoe, uh, thing, uh, you know what I mean? All that sort of stuff around it to sort of invite businesses cobblers. back in. Cobblers, that's the one. It's a lot of cobblers, Paul. <laughs> So to in increase, you know, the, um, the, the, the businesses in that, to, you know, to cause regeneration. Um, and obviously, because people have got to dwell time while the car's charging. So having, uh, you know, shops there that can benefit from that is great. Now, what the last time I was talking to Fraser from Dundee Council, uh, they're in the process of electrifying the top floors of the four new car parks that they've got, which will create approximately another 150 slow charge points and the idea behind those is that people that live in the local area in all the tenement flats can utilize them at night when the car parks are empty to charge the vehicles up overnight because they can't park on the street to me that's how it should be done yeah i agree me too yeah. absolutely i 100 agree with that and it's such, that's a really really good example of a scenario that is akin to the on street or the or the low powered solution, but, but for the masses. And that's the thing, that's the biggest key for me in this debate so far is looking at the future of how many vehicles yeah. are going to need to charge at the same time. That yeah. fixes it. The, the yeah. other scenarios, and this is where Paul and I disagree, the, the other scenarios which he, he refers to will not solve that problem because there'll be too many cars looking to use the same thing at the same time. Whereas Matt, your, your example, that is a cracker because that solves the off street, that on, uh, the, the, yeah. The people who don't have on street, uh, off street, sorry, charging. It's it's a great example of where it will work if you have that scale. Yeah. Now, now then, Paul, very quickly because we've got other bees here. Well, I was I was just going to say thank you, Sam, for listening to my presentation, which did mention two electrified car parks and mentioned that explicitly. Um, but uh, the, my point in all of this is it's it a blended a blended solution, um, and the blending of lots of different things to meet the needs of lots of different people. But there are some really great ideas and there's some average ideas, uh, but if we work them together, they will, they will do the job. Um, and electrified car parks is definitely a really good option. So I'll shut up now. Right, so JB, how are we doing time-wise? We are good. We've got uh, maybe time for one, more, one or two more questions in the question and answers, but we need snappy um, yeah, answers. Yeah. So we've got Will Burgess, Willem Bartman and Peter Baker in the Q&A box asking questions. Will Burgess asks, do we ever think there'll be a time when charging can happen as fast as petrol and diesel refueling? What do you think? Uh, yes, I mean, we, 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 in theory, if, we, if, if you were privileged enough to drive a Porsche Taycan and you turned up where I am today, then you would get pretty close to that. Now that's not real world for most people, but the infrastructure is, is surrounding me right now. And I'm not trying to make this into a sales pitch, but it's here. So the vehicles now need to catch up. Um, and they will do. So um, I, I think the scenario, I think Paul raised it earlier about the fact that it's naughty to 80%, naught to 80% is a really important factor. There is a charging curve, which means that vehicles when they get to the softer state of charge slow down dramatically. But if you've got a vehicle that can do three, 350 mile range and you whack in two, 250 in 10 minutes, you're getting very, very close to the scenario of a petrol station and actually having a time to rest and have a coffee and, and, and check your emails, you're done. So you know, in technically speaking, we're basically there now but all of the different models and the different vehicles and the different charging infrastructure needs to now develop to make that mainstream. I do love the fact that you used naughty to 80%. Love that, Sam. <laughs> naughty. Uh, it's very naughty. naughty. I Sarah. want to supplement Go Sam's Sarah. comment just to say that even before EV charging was a thing at motorway service areas, people would dwell between sort of 13 to 18 minutes, I think was the fact, because the commerciality of it is what they want to even if you're filling up quickly they still want you to buy some stuff so they make you weave your way through so nothing's changed it boils down to behavior change every single time so let's just get people used to this idea first and worry about the highest highest speed stuff second paul so i, I just want to reiterate the point that um fundamentally destination charging is not a solution or a forecourt charging is not a solution currently under the financial current model for the common man that buys a vehicle 
because what? it's too expensive. Because they're not available right now it, everywhere. Well, it's too expensive. The technology that they will have will not be your 350 kilowatt anytime soon. The average age of a vehicle in the UK is 7.8 years. You know, we are talking really, really a long time before people are ever going to get close to that. So the best thing to do is to change the model completely and um, to replicate some kind of home charging to deal with a two tier system. Because we've got the people that have and the people that have not. It doesn't affect any motoring um, scenario more than it does here. If you have a drive, you have the benefit of getting 12p, 10p, as low as 4p or even free um, electricity for your vehicle. If you don't have a, a driveway, you have to pay at least whatever price you come up with, Sam. It's always going to be more than the uh, the networks um, that, that people can get with at home. A like a petrol and, station and service station example then, right? It, exactly, yeah. So we can't survive on 110, 111 motorway service station scenario. We can't do that. We've got to be able to uh, get the electrical infrastructure to the individual. And then, uh, Paul Barnfather, I think it was the question, then it's quicker than getting a petrol or diesel charge because you spend no time at all doing it. You just plug it in and then you just unplug it. It's no time at all in effect because you don't have to go anywhere or do anything because you just plug it in and walk away. Forget about oh, it. Good spot. Thank you, matey. I really appreciate that. JB. Yeah, so we're on. Uh, so we're up to uh, the next part of the show. So, um, Johnny, I my um, Wi-Fi yeah. went down. James, yeah, right. James. What yeah. we'll do is we've got a spare five minutes a bit later on in the show. So if you don't mind, just hang it on. Yeah, sure. Um, and then we can uh, see if we can get you on a bit later on. Is that all right? Cheers. I'll hang on. Lovely. You can stay online and and add your points in the discussion. Feel free to just keep your camera on and stuff. So. Okay. Now then, um, you have a journey to make, but you won't make your destination on one charge. You've done all the correct things. You've planned your route via ZapMap, uh, chosen a rapid for a break. You need one anyway. But because there isn't any grid serves on route, you may have to plan for three, just in case one or two fail, or, or somebody's already on it, as we've already said. Um, and even though you've checked the reviews on ZapMap, one of them fails. Or someone is already charging, and you kindly put this clever clock in place but you just simply don't want to, to wait but basically what i'm saying is luck is not on your side and you decide to charge it and the worst happens it's never happened to me i might add raise your hand panelists if it's happened to you but you've run out of charge what do you do <laughs> right well, it has nearly happened to me because i push my luck for everything i do <laughs> it seems to happen to john um, so, yeah. John, I don't know if you want to give us a, an introduction to RAC, who are up next, who are doing something a bit different. They're doing a, a little bit of live ro roving reporting to show us uh, the latest developments in case that happens to you or in case, you know, John gets in that situation again. So, hello, RAC. Welcome to the EV Cafe. Are you there? Hi, Johnny. Thanks very much for having us along. Love no worries. On the debate today. Yeah, it's, it's been great fun. We can we can hear you loud and clear, Simon. So uh, we'll, we'll hand it over to you. We, you don't have just you have uh, a little bit more than five minutes because I appreciate you showing us some some interesting stuff for our EV drivers. So uh, I, I think ten minutes is what we've given you for the for today. So you've got the right. time slot. But Sarah, we'll keep an eye on your time. Over to you, Simon Williams. I head up uh, PR at the REC, and I'm an EV spokesman. Um, as I'm sure you know, the REC has been around forever, um, looking after vehicles ever since they first appeared on our roads. Um, over the years, we've seen many changes, uh, but none more so now than our kind of journey to low emission driving. And that obviously pre uh, presents some serious challenges to us as a breakdown company. Um, according to uh, SMMT data, we've now got uh, around 170,000 uh, EVs been registered since 2010. And that's obviously leading to an increasing number of uh, breakdown calls. In fact, we're now seeing around 500 um, calls uh, a month for uh, EVs, predominantly to out of charge uh, vehicles. Now, we've been fortunately for thinking about this for some considerable time, and we've uh, developed our own solution, a solution in which we wanted uh, to be able to deliver from a standard REC patrol van. Um, the reason we went down this route was because we felt it was really not practical to flatbed uh, every out-of-charge vehicle to uh, the nearest charge point. 
or to a, an EV forecourt now. Um, and we didn't feel it was very good for the environment either to have these great big flatbeds going in and out of busy towns. Not good for the environment, not good for congestion. Uh, what's more, we don't think it's really um, that great an impression for prospective EV owners, uh, nor for manufacturers to see their vehicles on the back of a flatbed. Um, we believe our solutions are kind of uh, leading the way in the breakdown market. Uh, and I'm now going to hand you over to um, my colleague uh, Chris Millwood for, in our National Technical Centre in Warsaw, who's going to talk you through uh, how we're dealing with out-of-charge electric vehicles. Chris, over to you. Thanks, Simon. I uh, hope everyone can hear me okay. Yes, mate. Lovely job. Thanks, uh, thanks Simon. Uh, and uh, hi, Johnny. First time here, so uh, it's great to be here. Thanks for having us. So um, behind me here is um, our concept vehicle, um, which is an EV charging vehicle. I'm just going to run through a very quick demonstration and, and what we do with this at roadside. So originally um, we had a battery system that we found that was very heavy and uh, we wanted a lightweight portable system that we could retrofit uh, to all patrol vans. We know that this problem you know, is coming. Um, it's not to the volume that, that we expect yet. So if we can retrofit to the existing fleet, then we can support um, our EV drivers. And basically we call it a fuel cam for electric vehicles. We cover the ice engines fuel. We want to cover the EV fuel as well. So um, it's, uh, under the engine, there's a second generator. This is the first, um, this is the first version. I want to talk to you about some developments that we've done. Um, in the, inside here, there's a, um, an inverter and a control unit. I'll just get the engine started. What we do is uh, it's a very straightforward box. It's got an LCD screen. It gives you the output, the charge time, and makes sure that everything's connected. So all you do from an operator's perspective, you'd hit the green button. And you can see the speed controller. I don't know if you can hear that through the microphone, but the engine speed is, is around 1200 RPM. Let to take the lead. So we've got a, so we've got a vehicle that may require an emergency charge. And it's, it's really important that we, we remember this, that we do an emergency charge because it could be a damage free recovery. Um, when the EVs cut out and we've been running virtually every EV out of charge to see how they behave, a lot of them, they jam into park, the electric handbrakes come on, um, and they're in an inaccessible place. So actually, uh, the emergency charge might just be a way of, of a damage-free recovery. Normally, we would have to send uh, a 12-ton SLA, maybe two men, and what we would do is skate to move the vehicle. So from our perspective, as well as an EV charge, it allows us to, to, to remove that vehicle effectively, efficiently, with no damage at roadside. So we'd pop this in, and then off it would go. Now, this is only a, a three and a half kilowatt system. Um, we've got circa 100 out in the field as a trial, as a pilot, and we've got loads and loads of learnings from this where we see some vehicles um, that would actually, uh, that they would give you a minus 20 range when you hit zero. You get some vehicles that sooner they hit zero, they cut out. So it's been a real learning curve. Also, um, actually, the, the mileage range is, uh, is so different when, when the weather's different, when it's raining or when it's cold. So, um, you know, we're picking a lot of EVs up. Um, I'll just get the engine shut off at one sec. So we're picking a, a lot of EVs up at charge posts. Uh, it's funny when you said it's all about the helping the people. They've gone, they've gone to a charge post. They've got the only charge post there, and it's out of charge. And we've been to quite a few call-outs. As Simon said, we're doing around about 500 a month. When they get to the, the charge post, it's out of order. They've got 10 miles left. They haven't got enough for the 18-mile trip. So we're getting called out to a vehicle that has, actually hasn't run out. It's at the services that... Can't, can't recharge, if that makes sense. We're also getting calls to people's home addresses when they've got the lead for um, roadside charging, but they haven't got the granny lead, the 13 amp pin lead. So we've actually gone to people's houses and charged the vehicles up so they could go and, and get it charged up at a post. You know, we're not gonna replace charging. It's not, it's not I mean, you guys talk about numbers, but it's massive about charging. This is an emergency charge, as I say, for, for, that, for that stressful situation. Uh, and we can remove that vehicle or extract it into a place where we're not gonna damage it. So developing on um, three and a half kilowatts is, you know, is, is really low. As, as you well know, you're all experts. So the feedback with the guys out in the field, um, is we were looking at a new generator. So at the time, in 2018, we started looking at this as a project. Um, you know, we, the feedback from the patrols, um, interestingly, some vehicles are harder to do. Once they've cut out and they've run out of charge, they go into the turtle mode, they cut out dead. Actually, the wake up period is quite a long time. Uh, yeah, it's a pilot signal and the handshake of the vehicle. So we've actually got quite a good list now, a database of all the vehicles and the technologies, how quick they charge from, from a run-out situation, which you know, is pretty unique. 
So one of the things we looked at is um, we're looking at, and we're getting this fitted and upgraded, is um, a new type of generator. So it's different technology to, theoretically, it's a second alternator under the, under the version one. This is a 10 kilowatt unit, and it really is light, okay, which is critical for us because at the moment, every kilo in the van is a kilo off our train weight. It's a kilo that we can't recover because we use the vehicles as a single source completion. So they do rescue work and they would recover as well. So we can't overload it with weight. That's why we've gone to this portable lightweight system. So that is a, a 10 kilowatt generator. Um, and you could run it at seven and a half kilowatts quite comfortably to get your, your best out of your AC, uh, your AC charging. Again, 18 months ago, which isn't really a long time, you know, we were looking at the, the company that we use in Shrewsbury, they, they, the, the board technology, I mean, this is all shrunk down. You know, within the small amount of time I feel, mm. it's developed into a lot, a lot of lightweight unit and more power for roadside. Also, um, we, as I said, Simon said, we've got a lot of OEM accounts. And uh, if we can keep electric vehicles off flatbed, that's got to be good for the brand and electric vehicle drivers. We've got a lot of fleet um, customers or utility customers that are buying hundreds of EVs and they're looking at us for some guidance on what they can do. So another thing we're looking at is um, they've got a lot of workshops can we supply them a skid generator that could go in a service van? This is just a crude idea. We want to get a, a really smaller engine. So if we can get, if we can shrink that down to half size and put a 10 kilowatt or, a, or seven and a half kilowatt, that could sit at the workshop. But when they get one of their drivers run out, they could attend themselves with a service van. It's quite a cheap, effective way of doing that. Um, some of the engines we've been looking at are, um, are, are bio, they could run on plant-based fuels. So actually there's no NOx gases, which is, you know, I know there's a lot of emotion around that in, in the cities. So uh, I think you know, from an EV perspective, we're trying to cover off a, a lot of angles on that. Um, I, I think at this point, I'll hand you back to Simon. Brilliant, that was fantastic. Thanks for that. Thanks, Chris. I'm happy to, happy to take any questions uh, from anyone that uh, has any. Yeah, I just want to say one thing though, I'd just like to point out that if the driver had chosen a Zoe, <laughs> And they would have had a lot more range, so they might not have needed to use the system. <laughs> I was going to say a Vauxhall Corsa in its normal position on a trailer. I'm sure we'll be seeing you very soon. Obviously, you'll get preferential treatment. Being a <laughs> Thanks for not using that. It depends so, on what you drive. Everyone pushes uh, their luck to the absolute limit, whether it's 350 miles or 100 miles. Yeah. Another potential customer for us. So over to the panelists, do we have any questions for RAC? So they're new to the VCAP. I know we've had uh, Dean Hedger at time to time uh, from the AA, but really interesting to see what you've, you've got there, Simon. I do believe John had his hand up first. We'll go over to John and then Sam. I just want to, I wonder if the RAC would counter something that's just been put in the um, chat box. Simon, somebody's just said blatant bannering and you know advertising of your services i don't think that's anything to be ashamed of do you you've done some bloody good work there and come up with a solution which is needed where's the problem it might have been Vauxhall. i don't know whether it was about the car we showed or rc <laughs> no idea yeah i mean every, every electric vehicle is going to run out from time to time because that's down to the uh, user as we're hearing quite a lot of today um we're just moving with the times clearly we're moving towards a uh, low emission driving and that's pr uh, you'd like to kind of be electric um, and we as a breakdown organization need to be there to look after our uh, customers and to make sure that they, we can help them complete their journeys uh, it's just the way things are going apologies to ian uh, i should say that he's now clarified and he was actually complaining that johnny was just going on about renault so my humble apologies i'm missing <laughs> 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 Shameless. I must say we are not partisan or or um, <laughs> linked to any company as such. We are celebrating the collaboration and transformation of electric vehicles and the support that is required. Cool. Oh, Sam. I had a question. Um, hi, Simon. Uh, fantastic, by the way. Great presentation. And, and, uh, yeah. It's really cool to see, see it mm -hmm. in the flesh like that as well um, and seeing how all the, all the bits and stuff goes together. It's great. Um, one question I have for you is, I think, and please nobody or somebody may well correct me on this, but I think it's the Rivian pickup truck in the States that can charge while it's being towed. Yeah. Which sounds to me like a really good idea. Do, do you think that the solution, not the, your solution, so, but do you think the future of recovery might be utilizing what's already there technologically in terms of towing the vehicle for a duration of time in order to recharge it to a meaningful amount so that it can go about its journey? That sounds fantastic. And, you know, we're, we're really keen to um, 
you know, look at everything we've been innovating, you know, for, for years. Um, and we've, you know, we would love at the moment, this, as you probably realize, is working from a Euro 6 diesel van. Um, which is, you know, clearly, you know, has to change going forward. But, you know, we've been looking at um, trying to kind of find an EV van that has the towing capacity that we need as the ROC. Uh, and as yet, there isn't anything around. I think Chris, who was just presenting, was trying one the other week and ended up having to do a five mile walk home because uh, it didn't Correct. quite yeah. make it for him. Um, we yeah, also, wasn't, just, just to clarify something, I wasn't referencing the fact that you need to have an electric vehicle to tow just now because I know how challenging yeah. that might be. But, but the ability to sort of um, long, is, is the solution likely to be towing vehicles, do you think, that, that then charge whilst you're towing them? Yeah, I mean, that would be fantastic. I mean, we'd be more than happy to, or we'd love to talk to the, uh, the manufacturer concerned. Um, we're looking at everything. Obviously, at the moment, we've, we're looking after a massive um, base of uh, people who are, are predominantly in ICE vehicles. So we've also got, uh, in the back of that vehicle you saw earlier, our rapid deployment trailer, which we've had for many years, which we developed uh, initially, we've now modified that. So we have uh, two extra wheels, we can a dolly if you like. We can lift all four wheels of a stricken vehicle up. Obviously this has been more important um, due to the SUVs we have now, but also electric vehicles that can't necessarily be towed on two mm. wheels. So if we can't charge them, we can still move them without them having to wait for a flatbed to come along and pick them up. Because obviously that's got to be better from a customer's point of view because they don't have to wait as long because the patrol can resolve it from the back of the van. So we're looking at everything we possibly can. And if there's another solution which involves kind of towing somebody and charging them up at the same time, that would be amazing. John, over to you. Simon, a very quick one. Uh, when we had the AA along, Dean Hedger suggested that they had something in the region, forgive me if I've got this wrong, but it was something in the region, 300 um, breakdowns, if you like, of electric vehicles a year. And you're talking about 500 a month. Now, we've heard many times on the EV Cafe of how reliable electric vehicles are. Is 500 a month the right figure? Absolutely. Uh, we clearly work with Renault and Nissan, um, the Leaf and the Zoe. Uh, say they very... break down a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm saying they break down, but the people who drive them run out of charge quite a bit, unfortunately. Wow. We, oh. we all work with um, British Gas as well, um, and they have quite a few EVs. Um, but of course, the problems are still going to be from a breakdown point of view. Our number one problems are now batteries um, and you know punctures, wheel batteries change. Batteries being 12 volt batteries rather yeah, than... Yeah, but yeah. as Chris will... And the, the, yeah, the, the, the 12 volt auxiliary batteries. Yeah, the 12 yeah. volt auxiliary batteries. Yeah, we're going to see a lot of that with EVs as well. Yeah. still a high failure rate on them. And just, just so that people understand that, that's the battery that is tr the traditional battery sits under the, the bonnet and powers your windscreen wipers, your radio, that kind of internal stuff. It's not what drives you along. That doesn't cause the problem. No, but obviously, I, I, well, Chris, I don't know if you'd like to tell you that, but obviously the uh, 12 volt battery is key for starting the vehicle in of many course. instances. Yeah, so course, yeah. that's still going to be a problem for the future. Quite. Yeah, SLL, you know, standard flooded batteries or AGM ESBs, they're still going to be about on this system for many years, I should think. Okay, excellent. James, over to you, and then we're going to do uh, some mailroom, because we seem to have 15 questions still in the Q&A. So, over to you, James. Okay, yeah, hi, thanks for that impression on the um, ROC. Um, we're hearing a lot of press about the smart motorways. Um, I'm guessing the point you made about having this four-wheel bogey would support that, but I guess... <laughs> If somebody in an EV, for whatever reason, if they've been stuck or diverted and they um, end up running out of energy on a motorway, if it's a smart motorway, um, I guess you've really got to get them off the motorway rather than try and recharge them on a live lane or what was a live lane. Yeah, I mean, obviously the process for smart motorways is um, tricky. You know, uh, the issue with uh, electric vehicles from our point of view is coasting because at the moment, uh, if you break down on a smart motorway, you're going to be uh, your your place of safety is the emergency refuge area. Then those at the moment are up to two and a half kilometres apart. Mm. When they were first uh, smart motorways first came to uh, into being on the M42 in the West Midlands, um, they were every 500 to 800 metres apart. So that gave you a good chance of reaching one. Uh, particularly if you're in an EV, but obviously that wasn't the case then. Now, uh, without hard shoulders, you've got, you're in a sticky situation, whether you're in a conventional vehicle or an electric vehicle. 
Um, we can't attend in a live lane. We can attend in those emergency refuge areas. Uh, we wouldn't charge you there and then. I think we would probably get you off uh, to a place safe to a, to a service area where you could actually charge properly. Um, it's, uh, we've had serious issues. We've given evidence to the Transport Select Committee about smart motorways. We uh, want to see, uh, see stop vehicle detection technology introduced. So there is a chance, but of course, um, we also have issues with the spacing of the gantry signs, because if you don't know the, the lane is closed with the red X, then uh, that is no use at all, because you know, a vehicle could come plowing into the back of you if you're broken down in lane one on a smart motorway. So there are all kinds of issues with smart motorways, particularly, I would say, if you're in an electric vehicle at the moment. Yeah, okay. Excellent, thank you. Um, so, John, should we do some uh, Q&A in the mail room? I just want to highlight a few points from that discussion, actually. Um, so the first one is, yeah, Paul is right. We are a place for impartiality, but I am still able to love my Zoe. Um, <laughs> in, in terms of the figures, it did look a bit uh, on the bad side. Um, I guess being a partner with the Alliance, of whom really released the products uh, 10 years ago, you're likely to have a little bit more data than, than others. Um, and especially maybe on older generation of product, you'll maybe seeing that as well. So that's, that's where the figures are coming from. But John, I am conscious that uh, we don't have that much time before the next guest speaker and we've got 17 outstanding questions. So do you reckon we could give that some time? Is that right? What Rapid fire, to... please guys, come exactly. on. Exactly, so we've just got to get on with it. Uh, Simon, <laughs> will the cost uh, be greater for RAC membership with electric vehicle breakdown or is it staying the same? Um, at the moment, it's the same. Uh, I think as we've talked about, we don't have uh, you know, the, uh, the actual kind of cut through the share of electric vehicles is still pretty small. Uh, things might change going forwards, but at the moment it's part of your IOC membership. Um, and somebody else, Paul Barnfather, Simon has asked, uh, have you looked at portable battery packs to jump charge a dead EV? Yeah, we started with yeah. that, but you know, there's a massive yeah. uh, problem with- uh, Simon, yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry, yeah, we, sorry yeah, um, we've, um, yeah, we have, we, we started off with that, but um, it was the technology at the time. I mean, it's nothing to say that we could always look at four in the future, but it was just too heavy. As we say, we multi-purposed the vehicles. It was just, um, they were too heavy for the van. Yeah, every, every RVC patrol van uh, has 500 parts and tools on board. So if you start adding extra weight from a big battery pack, yeah, that's not going to work for us. Um, and obviously we've got a really lightweight mobile solution at the moment. Yeah, and speaking of weight, Tony Shorthouse asks, is there a realistic limit on the size of EV to charge roadside? Chris, that's probably one for you. Um, well, it's just the length of time. So, um, I mean, we've never, to be fair, the only vehicle at the moment that we've not tested is the Tesla. Um, so uh, most of the other ones we have. So, um, yeah, it's, obviously it's a kilowatt of the battery takes the time. So, and it is only an emergency charge. And as Simon said, um, you know, that's what we have the all wheels up for as well. So if we were in a situation that we couldn't charge it, then we would recover it anyway. Uh, post. Thank you, mate. Ian Muller, uh, bless him. I, know, I owe him this one because I misquoted him earlier. Uh, how many of the 500 breakdowns are not for running out of charge? Do you know? Uh, I personally um, don't, Chris and uh, James. No, there's um, on them charge ones as well is um, auxiliary batteries as well. So we do split that yes. between auxiliary. So, you know, it's, it's, it's around about probably 50-50, really. Auxiliary batteries against high voltage batteries being out of charge. And there's obviously condemned batteries in that as well from the 12 volt battery. Right. Perfect. Um, can you see a time when an EV van with charger rescues a stranded EV? So it's a similar question, isn't it, really? It's, we'd love to be in that situation. Um, and uh, we, we've... As I say, we're testing EV vans, the three vans we've tested so far. Um, it's just at the moment, as Simon said, it's the range and the towing capability is our challenge. We're looking at an electric EV flatbed as well. Um, so, you know, we'd like to think, uh, you know, we're pretty um, move at a, a quite a, a rate of knots. We're trying to, you know, we'd like to think that would happen. Yes, definitely. That's our ambition. Was it, Simon, was it an easy thing to get the RAC to sign up to EVs and to be as supportive as you are? Because the AA have said, you know, for some time, yeah, we're in. We, we see that there's this move. Was it a battle within the RAC or was it relatively straightforward for you? Not, a, not at all. I mean, the Chris and the team, James uh, Gibson, our head of technical, they just love taking on these challenges and finding <laughs> solutions. We've just, you know, that's what we do. That's our, that's our kind of reason for being in the technical department to kind of, 
find the best solutions for our drivers. You know, we were the first to come up with the uh, multi-fit wheel. Um, obviously, you have lots of vehicles now with um, don't carry spares. We found a solution to that. We developed the rapid deployment trailer. We've now extended that to work with this all wheels up recovery system. Um, we just love a technical challenge and we will always find a solution for our customers. Do you think that uh, wireless charging has got any play, p place in this or is that going to be so uh, problematic in putting it into the roads um, that, that it's never going to happen? It was really interesting listening to the debate earlier and uh, I'd love to have chipped into that and uh, being the RSC's fuel spokesman and knowing we have uh, eight, eight uh, and a half thousand uh, forecourts on average and 32 million cars, 40 million vehicles in total. There's an awful lot of vehicles to get charged. And I think probably a mix of all the charging solutions. And if you could start to introduce that into the road and make it, make it work, that would be fantastic. Mm. We also, um, we've also surveyed, uh, we carry out a major study every year called the REC report on motoring. We surveyed 3000 uh, drivers this year and people want to see uh, the average uh, range of an electric vehicle get up to 375 miles before they're prepared to kind of get into the market and go and get one. Mm. But obviously the biggest uh, hurdle of all is the price and uh, people are seriously put off by the price at the moment. And we also need to see them filtering through to the second hand market because we know around I think 8 million vehicles are sold uh, every year in terms of second hand and most of those are sold, um, are sold used as I recall. Mm. Yeah, that's helpful. Sam, you wanted to say something. You're on mute, you muppet. Sorry, I had all I had, I had Take all a point off. Point off for that. <laughs> yeah, you need you need me. You need me to take some points off, mate, I think. Uh, oh, no, don't do that. No, it's a very quick point on induction charging. I think that we just need to differentiate between dynamic and static. So static being something where it's parked on your driveway and charging, which I think will have its place probably in a few years from now. Um, dynamic is much, much harder in terms of charging on motorways, etc. That is many years away, but I think it's useful just to differentiate between the two as we start to understand um, new ways of charging that might, might occur over the next few years. That's very helpful, mate. Thank you. Now, we've done 10 questions. We've got 15 still in the box. JB, how are we doing? Um, we've got, I reckon we've got a few more minutes. So um, can, can I, we get a few more questions? Yes, we can. Sorry, Sorry, Paul. Can I just, just one, because Simon just spoke. Um, he mentioned one of the biggest barriers to adoption is that, that sort of range, that 375. I would counter that, that um, I think education is the biggest, one of the key barriers to adoption, which is you know kind of why we exist. Because people need to realize they don't need 375 miles for most of the, it's an occasional need. Um, people can charge on the hoof or at home. And they fill up every night and, and a, a typical ice vehicle doesn't fill up every night. It doesn't fill up, you know, at the side of the road or on a forecourt. I mean, it does on a forecourt, but it, 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 we, we need to look to change the model, not reinvent. We don't need big 375 mile batteries. Otherwise, we'd be seeing them in the van market. Um, the van market does, in some cases, need the bigger batteries, but cars certainly don't for the majority. And I think we just need to help people understand that there is a different way of doing things not doing the same thing on a different um you know drivetrain fair enough that's me done sam uh somebody yeah. john taylor uh, from uh duran duran it seems will uh, will we see destination and forecourt chargers use a time of use pricing like Octopus Agile. So essentially, if you pitch up at three o'clock in the morning when nobody else is charging, will you get it cheaper than if you do it at five o'clock in the evening? Mm, yeah, okay. So um, we certainly, you know, the, the, the business itself has many revenue streams. One of those is battery storage. We've got five megawatt battery on site here. Um, so we'll be using time of use to trade, trade with the grid ourselves um, on that side. Um, on the side of the customer, um, it will be, it will be a, a straight competitive per kilowatt as it is for everybody else for, for a little while yet. But I think that in the fullness of time, uh, it stands to reason that there will be more varied pricing during different times of day. Yes, I think that okay. will happen. But again, it's, it's, it's quite a complicated exercise to do that uh, and to keep it fair to the customer as well. Um, so I think it's something that will probably will come in the fullness of time. But again, not in the near future for us or anybody else for that matter, I suspect. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got time for another one. Um, I think we'll hold fire. I think it's a time for our next guest speaker. So we'll uh, come back to that very shortly. John, if that's okay. Thank you all. 
Um, James, we will hear from you. <laughs> um, we'll we'll, we'll hear from the next. James. Next, we'll shoehorn you in at the very, at the end, near to, towards the end. <laughs> okay, um, thanks. <laughs> and I'll, I'll just do a very quick. Um, it's not, I won't do the five minutes, but there's no. a couple of points I did want to make about real life charging as as somebody that does real life charging. So thanks, Johnny. James, maybe what we'll do is we uh, it, it's time to welcome Neil Derno from uh, Hitachi ABB Power Grids. But uh, maybe straight after Neil, you could you could go then. Um, so then we have sort of five minutes from Neil and then uh, however long you need. But maximum five minutes, James, from you afterwards. Is that OK? Yep, perfect. Thanks. And then we'll ask all of our special guests to come on camera, and we'll go. We'll, we'll fire out those um, answers to all those questions. All right, over to you, Neil. Welcome to the EV Cafe. Thank you. Am I coming through loud and clear? Yeah. Yes, you certainly are, but we can't see you. Uh, that's probably the best thing. Well, look, here, that's me there. See me oh, coming no, in. I've got you back. Got I back. can see you. Yeah, sorry, it's me. It's I've me. I've got my RAC coloured. Uh, vest on or gilet as the modern parlance would go. Um, <laughs> delighted to be here. Uh, uh, wow, what fascinating debate already. Uh, been a really good session. So, um, but let's talk power plays, right? Uh, so, when I think power plays as a cricket fan, um, I very much think, mm, okay, I'm going to have a short period where things are going to get really intense. So, maybe that doesn't work. I then did a little bit of digging around and thought, what else is a power play? And there's lots of books and films. But they like blowing up cars and stuff. And I thought, well, that doesn't work. Um, I then started finding some little bit more exciting stuff around some nice racy little numbers, which were power plays. I spent a little bit too much time and I found a Jilly Cooper book, which was just a little bit too racy called Power Play. Um, but I think this probably is what makes me think most about where we are in terms of a power play. So it is the sort of sports analogy still. But there's so many options, right? There's so many things that might happen, that could happen, that should happen. Uh, and so I guess it's about striking the balance, okay? And in the interests of uh, winning. Uh, and then uh, I'll talk about who decides and who wins and stuff like that. But uh, I don't know if we recognise that fella. Um, I was just doing a casual trawl around. Um, <laughs> Is that Johnny? I don't know. Is that Johnny? No, um, it's not. All right, okay. All right, Ginger. He looks happier. He was yeah, that's from my life. He's smiling, that's how we know it, and him. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> the trouble um, is, both you guys look the same. <laughs> <laughs> so, just a bit, little bit of wordplay, if you will, right, to help us get into this. So, are, are we talking about supermarket demand side, or are we talking about supermarket supply side? Are we talking about uh, driveway or are we talking about highway um, and then you know that's probably we're, we're starting to think about these larger sites where there's lots and lots of dual chargers coming through um, but equally you know we've got this whole scenario where we've got lots and lots of individual requirements uh, at one end we've got the four courts people so is it my way or is it four courts um, we've then got the whole smart charging piece uh, and, and I'm going to highlight Angela Merkel and this smart e-vehicle here as a, a warning, I guess, to us all um, that this could go wrong in a number of ways if we're not smart. OK, um, because we could either get left with very poor facilities dotted around in a very uncoordinated way, um, or we could have very smart facilities, uh, but all too centralised and not actually uh, servicing the market and that debate has been played out right in terms of the stuff we've already been discussing today so th these are very real world scenarios uh, from the, the current activities of striking the balance <laughs> when it comes to sort of who decides and who wins um, you know we decide right um, we've got to do some work with you know, lobbying the government um, working with the local authorities um, and, and not hitting them with a stick. I support Sarah in that. We, we've got to help them on this journey. Um, so those of us that are, I guess, a bit more genned up, doing things like we're doing today, which is actually about uh, levelling up the knowledge for more people. Um, the, the beautiful opportunity that we've got is really not to think about replicating petrol stations. Uh, and so a number of the things that we've gone through now really make me think about how we bring a more of a systems thinking perspective to this. And we actually create 
uh, infrastructure that supports how we can power zero emission vehicles, not how quickly do we get to replicate how we fuel ICE vehicles. So um, my world with uh, Hitachi ABB is actually in the large scale uh, power demands. Okay, so we talk about these things. We talk about powering bus depots. We talk about powering trains, light rail. Uh, but also we talk about the energy network system and you know, the power that goes around the country, which is probably more going to service the likes of uh, the Sam's grid serve model. Uh, and the strategic road network and the motorway service areas. And then I get really geeky and excited to talk about seaports and airports. Um, but all of those places represent key interaction points in energy and transport, where the requirements are so big that actually, if we do these things, it could stop us from getting on with stuff that's more domestic and SME. So actually striking the balance is important because we need to do both, right? We, we can't do one or the other. Um, it's really important that we can support more electric fleets, that we drive sustainability at all levels, and actually that we make journeys efficient. And that isn't about hypermobility, that's just about making things easily accessible for people. And do you know what, actually making transport and traveling nicer. Um, and so there's a number of things we need to do less of in there, clearly. Um, but this is where sort of I come from in terms of driving uh, the larger scale side of the equation um, and making sure it's done in concert with what we need to do at the private and smaller fleet level as well. So hopefully that makes a lot of sense because we can't see these two things as conflicting. All right. I know we've talked about the power play today and set them up against each other, but they're not. Right. The competition is two things. The competition is the OEMs going to other markets that have got their act together and have a better infrastructure than we do. Don't want that. Um, and the other competition is congestion, pollution, low health outcomes, uh, and you know, climate catastrophe. And we don't want that. All right. So when we talk about what we're competing with, let's not pit ourselves against each other from a high power versus small power uh, charging scenario. Um, this is the uh, corporate piece. Um, we do a lot of stuff in terms of technical solutions. Uh, and we have a lot of education and outreach work going on. Um, and the one I want to highlight is just that with the likes of uh, Hitachi, Hither, for Anstey, National Grid and the UK Major Port Group, we're talking about tomorrow is now uh, on the 24th of November, addressing many of these issues, but from a lot of different standpoints. Uh, on on, um, well, I'm just doing it in a really passive aggressive way. You've had six minutes, but it looks like we're at the end anyway. And the what, attack power end. grid was good. We've got to hear Guess about what? that 24th November. We're at the end. Um, so hopefully that made some sense. Hopefully that reinforces what we've already talked a lot about. Uh, and hopefully it was palatable. It was really good. What well on, Neil. Good work. Excellent. Thanks for that, Neil. James, you're up. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, guys. Uh, apologies for earlier. My power went off. My Wi-Fi didn't restart. And as I was about to start, um, somebody decided to um, cut the hedges with a power trimmer right outside my office. So it was probably just load balancing. Power went off. <laughs> wow, are you saying that the UK isn't ready for the technological revolution? I know, yeah. By any chance? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's great. It's great to be back on EV Cafe, and it's been, you know, I've been obviously listening to everything, and I think there's a real. I mean, I'm coming at this from a what we're calling a real life thing as an EV driver. I mean, I I don't know how far you you heard me because I saw the the screen freeze and then I dropped off. But um, having been in the industry for ten years. Um, uh, from 2014 to 2019, I was actually part of BP Charge Master team. And as everyone knows, BP Charge Master run the Polar Network. And that's currently the largest public charging network in the UK with over 7,500 um, public charge points. But from I'm uh, Chief Commercial Officer for Zoom. And Zoom is all about e-mobility as a service. And we're all about EV drivers and making sure that the EV driver has everything they need to have a great experience of, of their EV. So 
we focused on what the driver needs. And part of what we do is we call it an EV driver benefits bundle. And what's key for that is offering choice. This is how we see it and, and what's really successful for us. Offering flexibility. And what's really important is saving an EV driver money. So that's where we come from from a business point of view, but from a real life point of view, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm taking my Zoom hat off and I'm putting my EV driver hat on. And I think the key things to, to say is that listening to everything this morning, what's really important for everybody is there isn't a one size fits all for the now, because we're talking about here now and what's the future. Um, it has to be a blended solution, I think, is the, is, is the best thing. And I don't know what I missed while I was offline, but I really see this as a blended solution. And I'll take my own family as an example. I've got three children, grown-up children, and as a family, between us, we've actually got five plug-in vehicles, um, three of which are electric and, and of course, plug-in hybrid. And every single one of us in, our, in my close family have a different need for where they go, how they use the car, and, and their purpose. Um, so we all know that actually over 90% of, of charging is done at home. Um, and, and I guess we can all say, you know, we're all, most of us sitting at home now during lockdown. And if it was 90% then, it's certainly going to be more in the future as more of us get used to this um, way of working from home. So, you know, COVID-19 is meaning there's more home working. And, and it's already been picked up in one of the points. Actually, cars sit idle for something like 95% of the time on, on average. But that's, that's a whole other debate. So then when you're going to charge at home, the key thing that you'd need, and certainly something I look for as an EV driver, and that's not with my Zoom hat on, that's as, as an EV driver, is I want to have clean energy. That's, that's really important to me. I drive an EV because I... I I'm thinking about zero emissions and the environment. So I certainly want to have clean energy. When I get home in the evening, when I was traveling around, if I plug my car in at peak time, when everybody's cooking and so on, A, it's going to be expensive, and B, it's probably not clean energy. So there's a big shift to smart tariffs and, and charging cars at home um, when energy is cheaper and greener. That's really important. And of course, the other thing, and it's, it's really important, um, Graham Cooper does this great, um, has this great um, um, program with um, Harris from Top Gear, which is, which is really good. And, and Graham, you make the point across really well about easing demand on the grid. So, you know, using off peak time is, is really important. And of course, from where we come from, from Zoom, you're going to save money. So that's really important. But we also have to consider the drivers that don't have off street parking. And, and I think I'm right in saying that in London alone, 52% of drivers actually can't drive an electric car because they say they can't, um, can't charge because they don't have a driveway. And from a Renault point of view, and this is, this is a point I was talking to Johnny about this week, it's actually a, a, a hurdle to people buying an EV because you know, I hear people going into a Renault garage, would love to drive an EV, don't have off-street parking, and they go out the showroom with a Clio and not a Zoe. And, and of course, we, we really want them to be getting into a Zoe. So there is that, that's currently a barrier. But what we're actually seeing from a network point of view is, is actually a growth in the number of options for people that don't have um, off-street parking. So um, from where I come from, workplace, and then I referred to the polar network. In terms of a balanced view, polar network actually is really good because it does have 150 kilowatt. You, you showed a, an image of the one at Hammersmith. Now, when I went into there- Full of taxis. Yeah, sorry? Full of taxis. Full of taxis. <laughs> exactly, I was just gonna say, I was there last week and it was all, um, it was all black cabs, which, which is a shame. But, but you know, getting this blended, and I, I think what Sam's doing in the team at GridServe is, is amazing, and there's, there's definitely a place for that. But when we talk about supermarkets, which we've looked at there, um, town centres, gyms, destination charging, and I call that grazing. So that, there's a big place for grazing. So where I'm coming from in terms of how we charge and where we charge, yeah, I've got that, I'm going to finish. Um, Sorry. It's that blended view that I really want to get across. And people like the Chargemaster Network actually 
allow for that uh, blended view on, on the polar network. But in terms of where we go in the future, cars are having greater range, quicker charging time. So we'll see a whole different set of, of issues as we, as we go forward. But blended is where I'm at. Thank you, James. Okay. So you're uh, in the red corner with Paul. Yeah, it sounds um, like it. Yeah. yeah, that's an extra point for Paul there. Um, great to hear from you both, though, Neil and James. Uh, some really good stuff there, some good stuff insight. So if I could ask for the RAC team to come back online, Simon, um, for the last sort of uh, Q&A round that we have for this mm. session, um, the mailroom section led by our, our mailboy, John Curtis. So over to you, mate, uh, live in the mailroom. You almost said gorgeous mailboy then. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Simon, question for you. Is there a place for a small number of mobile rapid charge vans that mm. supplement the slow charging solutions being developed? What do you reckon? Yeah, that's not a bad idea. When we first looked at this, we did look at a, a big portable uh, van and we had it, you know, uh, in Birmingham. And, you know, something like that in London, Birmingham, Manchester, big conurbations could well be uh, practical. That's definitely worth looking at. And I'm sure uh, James and uh, Chris will be considering that. Fabulous. Now, something else you do, which is pretty wonderful, is that you give warranties on used cars. Have you got any plans to do the same sort of thing with electric vehicles? You know, the state of the battery and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's not something we're, we've looked at at the moment, but um, we'd like to see more electric vehicles actually appearing on the, the used market. Um, this is obviously you know, one thing that is definitely going to, is needed in order to kind of accelerate the take up. Uh, and I think as soon as that happens, uh, we'll be looking at it. I know the, the battery life will be a bit of a concern, but I think there's uh, an awful lot of battery life left in a vehicle, even after it's uh, kind of uh, the battery's kind of so-called finished for the road. Mm, OK, thank you for that. Question from Simon Tate. Now, if I'm right, Simon Tate is from Elmtronics and he's talking about, well, indeed, Love a bit of Elmtronics. Um, Northeast, just in case you're wondering, pretty fabulous. And they're asking about national, uh, definitely national. National now started in the Northeast. You're Bristol right. Bristol offices, everything. Yeah. Beautiful in Bristol. Um, costs for charging, home charging, workplace and destination charging. What does it cost? Um, also, you know, the, the rapids, the 50 kilowatts and above. What are we looking at in terms of price so that people get a sense of, of what they can have for their money? Sam, you got your mitt in the air? Yeah, I can, I can answer that if you like. Um, okay. So to, to give a very, very broad perspective of pricing, um, you'll typically pay on a, on a standard rate at home and domestic 14, 15 pence per kilowatt hour. Um, the type of time of use tariffs that you're able to achieve, I've, I've got one with Agile, uh, sorry, Octopus Agile, for example. So on occasion I pay negative, I get negative tariffs. So sometimes I can charge my car at home and get paid to charge my car. So, so there's a really broad spectrum on the domestic world in terms of the rates that you might expect to pay for charging. Um, in the more um, uh, c commercial world, as, as, as Paul phrased it, or the, or the uh, public charging network, uh, Tesla is, in, I think, in the region of around 20 to 30p now, late, late 20s, early 30 pence. 20, 25, hour. I think it is. So. Yeah, I think it might be going up soon, but um, it's around that mark. Um, and then you do have some eye-watering prices from some people, which, again, Paul has referenced, which is sort of 69 pence a kilowatt hour, which is heinously expensive and far, is not going to be good for the market. Um, so there's a real, real broad range of potentially negative pricing in terms of actually getting paid to charge your car at home all the way through to, to quite expensive charging at the very, very high power level at six or 70 pence a kilowatt hour. So there's a huge broad range of pricing depending on what you're connected to. Thanks, Sam. Kate Terrell, the one of the shockingly red hair, has asked a question about regulation. Is there any regulation in the marketplace for the maximum amount that can be charged per kilowatt hour? Or is it just what the market will stand? Any hmm. thoughts? Don't know, but what I do know is that um, regulation really isn't needed if you want to charge 69p a kilowatt because they're <laughs> cold anywhere near them. Self-regulation, right. I think, is uh, is really the example there. Charge too much, people won't use them. And actually, self-regulation is a good point. I think that there is a lot of market lever. You know, the whole fact that we're having this debate around around the different variables and the different blend of, of will will ultimately mean that, that certain things will be killed off. You know, and people that try to charge that that price won't survive. Yeah. 
um, and things that don't get used um, because they're impractical won't survive. Mm. You can't you can't keep putting money into things that don't work. So I think eventually the fullness of time is it's going to take some time. I think for this progression to happen, given that we've got so few EVs and an, and an uncertain world in terms of how best to charge them in the future. Mm. But I think I think things will ultimately market forces will drive will drive some degree of uh, simplicity in the market over time. I think. Yeah. Neil, you've got your mitt in the air, my friend. Thank you. Yeah, the, the really important thing is not regulation, it's transparency. So it comes down to uh, pricing signals in terms of not just digital, but also signposting just like with a fuel forecourt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, fair point. Thank you for that. Um, we've got a question, Simon. We, we have this reputation on the EV Cafe where even though it's uncomfortable, and difficult we'll ask the question and we'll talk about it just to get it out there and this is a, an uncomfortable one for you i think uh craig tong has asked is it true the rac is having diesel generators on their recovery vehicles for charging an ev is that right on our sorry on a recovery vehicle or a patrol vehicle on a well, it says specifically a recovery vehicle i suppose the question is do you use diesel generators to make electricity to power EVs? Yeah, that's, I thought we'd kind of cover that really because yes. yeah. basically we're working from a standard REC Euro 6 patrol van. Uh, we'd rather be doing it from an electric van, but that's just not possible at the moment. So, uh, you know, when we look at it in terms of um, numbers, um, you're actually, um, if we were to do it from a, recover, from a patrol van, we're going to use about half a litre of fuel. If we actually get a flatbed, to this, to any broken down electric vehicle out of charge. Um, it would probably have to do kind of 30 plus miles around um, probably eight pounds worth of fuel, uh, probably 20,000 grams more of carbon dioxide. So at the moment, it's the best solution. We'd much rather it was coming from an electric vehicle, we'd much rather it was coming from an electric vehicle charged by green energy. But that's just not um, the kind of op op uh, option available to us at the moment. No, and we live in the real world, Simon. You know, we're not we're not fools. We understand that we're we're in a transitional period, and what you're doing is fabulous. Yeah. It's better than where we were. I Thank think um, somebody an, an earlier commentator made made a point about some dedicated charging vehicles. Because if you went down the dedicated charging route, it's certainly possible that you could um, utilize electric vehicles. There's vehicles with enough payload to put a, a dedicated charger on board. I, I get that it's a, a graduation, but you've got to start somewhere. Yeah, can I come back on that? Because at the moment, we obviously, we have 1,600 patrol vehicles out there. We deal with around 7,000 random events that could take place anywhere. Mm. Um, you know, we know the majority of electric vehicles are in more urban areas, but that's not always the case. And we actually have a solution that can work, you know, pretty much wherever they break down, as long as, you know, we, at the moment we do have a limitation that we only have a hundred or so in circulation, but we're get, adding more all the time. So we're able to cope with it. And that's what we have to do as the REC. We have to be there to deal with all kinds of breakdowns for our customers. Yeah, right. Thank you, Simon. We've got a question in from Mark Griffin. Now, uh, viewers will know that the ITT hub is hosting the EV Cafe for one of our first live sessions next year. Check it out when it comes. Uh, and you will actually be able to come along and see us, hopefully, providing that COVID-19 is uh, kicked in the arse and gone away. And Mark Griffin asks, do we think that there's an opportunity with education to support teachers with subsidised uh, leasing and subsidised charging and putting charges into schools as a way of encouraging young people and seeing that ecosystem of renewable energy being generated from solar panels into battery storage and then charging for teachers. Paul was first, then Sarah. <laughs> Gotta be quick, Sarah. I'm just a, a blatant plug. My wife is a teacher, so I'm going to say absolutely. Um, but but the, I suppose the important point is that um, it's rumoured that Boris Johnson on Thursday will announce um, the move forward of the of the, the, the changeover deadline, um, and it's suggested that that will will create 32,000 jobs. Um, and if that does create 32,000 jobs, you'll need 32,000 people to fill them. And there's no better place to start than at the younger generation to give them the vision for the future, because they need to know that their climate, their um, the world is in good hands, and I think it would be a great idea to promote that and subsidise it in some way. 
and the changeover deadline that you're talking about is the 2030 ban on yeah. petrol and diesel cars or currently 2040 but is being consulted on and boris is due to make a statement tomorrow to yes. potentially bring that forward sarah i just wanted to say that the best way to inspire children is to not promote cars <laughs> um it's yeah. a really good idea for the future that they're looking at stem uh, technology. Let's put solar panels on, let's put battery storage on site. Let's keep the teachers' cars away, but they can quick and easily say, I drive an EV, the kids will know what that means. But yeah, I'm not at all in favour of taking the car anywhere near schools, whether it's electric or not. I knew I loved you for a reason, Sarah. <laughs> James, Jean-Louis. Another what debate. You... Yeah, I got, I got my hand up. Yeah, just, just a point on, on, on schools and education. And, well, you know, we mustn't forget that all, all, all these guys at school, so the children at school, are drivers of the future so we, we must must forget that and it's just an, a kind of anecdotal point that um, um, somebody I was talking to not that long ago was telling me how he drives an EV his wife doesn't they're looking at um, um, changing that but the interesting thing was his children or one of his children had said to him dad we don't want mum to take us to school we want you to take us to school or at least mum drive your car because we want we want the electric car to go to school at the school drop off, not the diesel. So just an anecdotal point there. <laughs> just a quick, quick one on this. Graham, uh, Graham Cooper. And we, we love Graham and, you know, he's our, our top gear advocate. We've got to give him the voice where we can. So he's um, put and mentioned, should we do a sweepstake on what date Boris will announce? Will it be 2030? Will it be 2032, 2035? I think certainly not 2040. That would, my money wouldn't be there. Uh, and do we think also that there may be something as a switch between cars and vans? That's I added that bit, as you can guess, but mm. should we? We, we? we should do a sweepstake on whether he's actually going to make the announcement when he says he might. <laughs> <laughs> You'll certainly pitch up 25 minutes late and keep us all waiting. Um, <laughs> right, Tony Shorthouse, Simon, has asked you, can people pre-book a roadside charge? Interesting question. So assume you go to an outdoor event or a holiday home or somewhere where there is no charging. Could you pitch up and charge their vehicle at a fee? Um, that's certainly not something that's happening at the moment. Doesn't mean to say it can't happen at the uh, in the future, particularly when we get more uh, vans. But obviously... We uh, have to balance uh, our acts, uh, our, our resources for looking after people who are actually broken down, i.e. out of charge uh, in this instance. So I think it's going to be going to be difficult, but it doesn't mean to say it can't happen in the future. Oh, okay. Simon, please Can don't promote lazy behaviour. Access to vehicles and the cars. You know, we just put out a piece of research this week um, based on the fact that... Um, 57% of people said having access to a car now is more important than ever due to the pandemic. And we haven't, and also within our report on motoring research, we haven't seen uh, such a low figure for the people who are prepared to switch to public transport if it was better. And so there's, I think the need for the car, uh, EV powered in the future is you know, going to be more important than ever. I've got, one final question, I think. We've got nine Brilliant. still in the box, but we're not going to get to it. This okay. one is this goes to the heart of what we are about at the EV Cafe. And it's a question from Willie Milne. And he posted it an hour ago, but I've been saving this. And he says, just listening to all the guest speakers and all the different views, I don't think it's very encouraging for consumers to buy an EV. So it's important that we state quite clearly, I think, that we are all joined as one family to move people from their behavior now to better behavior. And that comes through walking, cycling, not using cars when you don't need to, not using vehicles that you don't need. <laughs> but ultimately, where you do have to use vehicles, they are of the lowest emissions possible, and you play your part in securing a better future. It is really important that everybody understands that. We set this up this week as a fight. Basically, because if we just say we're all going to sit and agree with each other, it would make a boring webinar. And there are so many of those out there. We set this up to show that there are different opinions, but we are all as one. Neil, your hand is in the air, my friend. Thank you. So 
replacing all the ice vehicles with the same shape electric vehicles is a fail. All right. So we have got to do a smarter job of transport infrastructure and the transport system. We need to get people out of individual vehicles, especially uh, blocking up the roads or at the moment um, fouling up the air. And we need to give them easy, smart, clean, efficient, cheap transport. Uh, and so that is not all about electrons necessarily. It can be about any zero emission fuel. The best zero emission fuel is Weetabix that goes into your body that powers your things. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, Neil. Now we've got three people that want to speak. Johnny Berry, and then I'm going to see where we are with the scores because I think it's down to Paul and Sam for their final comments to see if they can score some extra points. JB, go for it. Uh, yeah, so I was just going to, I was going to start to wrap things up a little bit, but I'll let Paul and Sam go first and then we'll get to me. Is that all right? Cheers, buddy. Right. Um, who's leading where, Sarah, the referee? How are we doing? What's the scores Ooh, on the doors? Just to build the tension, I'm going to reveal it. Just keep fighting it out so you can get some more. Oh, you're mean. Right, okay, yeah. so... Uh, let's go with alphabetical order. Sam Clark with a C to go first. Yeah, okay. I'm just I'm, I'm going to wrap up by by answering the question that was it Willie? I think you said. Yeah, um, I had the question. Yeah, I mean the, the encouragement thing is a really important point, and it's and, it, and I have a fear, and I'm, my my fear is that the uptake of EVs as the acceleration of the models keeps coming. I've got two. I'm looking out the window here on the first floor of the building. I'm looking at a Honda Re and a Mini Cooper. They're fantastic. There's so many vehicles coming, but I'm so worried that the infrastructure that we currently have is going to let these vehicles down. So that it's going to discourage people mm -hmm. from the uptake. And that is my fear. And that's one of the reasons why I was so delighted to have this debate with you guys and with Paul, because, because my worry is we're going to hit a point where reputation is going to kick us in the, in the privates on the grounds that people are going to try and it's not going to work for them. There's going to be reliability issues. There's going to be inaccessibility issues. There's going to be oversubscription. They're the sort of things that worry me that if we don't get this right now, and I mean it needs to be now, that then the future 99% have the comfort of moving down this journey. If we start to get reputational damage by, by sporadic unreliability and, and uh, inaccessibility, then this market is gonna take a lot longer than all of us here want to see it grow and the speed that we want to see it grow. That's Thank you, Sam. Point. PK, oh, what have you got for us? So, I, you know, as I said at the beginning, we, we're in danger of violently agreeing. Um, you know, the, the whole purpose of, of what we do here and the debate that we're having is to drive uh, people like the manufacturers. I'm, I'm quite vociferous when it comes to the manufacturers about the, the equipment that they provide. Sometimes it just doesn't make the adoption of electric vehicles easy um, or, or in particular the operation of electric vehicles easy. What we want is people that are willing to take a punt at this early stage, because um, it is still relatively early um, for the adoption of electric vehicles to help drive the right solutions. I don't believe the right solution has yet been found. And certainly, you know, sticking a charge point outside a public toilet in Bradford on Avon certainly isn't the way to do it um, as a standalone, but to manage a diverse, uh, with everybody bought in across a blended solution, it gives people, everybody, the opportunity, whether you are rich enough to own a Tesla, a Taycan, or a Audi e-tron, um, or a Jag, you know, whatever, whatever it might be, the high cost stuff, and, and char cost of charging doesn't matter, that's fine. But for those of us that don't have off-street parking and um, need to access a, a, re a reasonably priced network. We need to have a blended solution and we need to be cleverer at what we're doing. And this is what the debate's about. It's not to put people off, but it is to be transparent. It is to poke and prod um, infrastructure providers, OEMs, and, and, and everybody involved in this industry to deliver a great service to the common man adopting an electric vehicle, be it brand new and hundreds of thousands, or be it used and three or four or five or 6,000, um, that they should have the same experience and not be impacted by price. Thanks, Thanks Paul. Paul. Yeah, before, good, good before, point. 
before we carry on, I just want to pick up somebody, Ian Hood. Ian Hood, you're a bad man and you are never coming back to the EV cafe because he <laughs> says, does this mean that self-charging hybrids are the real solution? <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> God. Someone kick him out, will you, John? <laughs> um, so I just want to start to wrap things up a bit. I just want to say this afternoon has been fantastic. Um, a lot of high energy, um, a really good debate. I think mean, Paul and Sam, you, you both raised very valid points, and I think we're all with you on, on both of that. Um, a big thanks to all the special guests, the panellists, the audience, everyone involved. It, it was a brilliant afternoon, as I say. Um, let's please carry this on via our social channels, so uh, such as a LinkedIn page, LinkedIn group. Um, so if you didn't have any, if you didn't have a question answered, then please ask it in the group. We're all in there, so we'll be happy to answer there. Um, the LinkedIn page is also live now from this week, which is where we will showcase all our future events. Um, but if you want to catch up on this one or any other episodes, any of the last seventeen other episodes or if you've missed something from today, then please feel free to visit our YouTube channel under EV Cafe. Speaking of future events, the next session, I think, are we in agreement that the 9th of December works for, okay, so, so we're gonna go with the 9th of December for the next session, um, and uh, agen you know, information on agenda and special guests will be announced in due course. Um, this will be our Christmas special, um, so exciting um, but please please click the link we'll put it in the chat box uh, it'll be in the follow-up email it's on the LinkedIn page it's the same link as always uh, and just to reiterate we do have a limited number on that so I'll, one of us will stick it in the chat box in a minute um, in the meantime there is another webinar taking place that only me and Paul are going to be uh, to be on but we will be joined alongside the infamous Neil Chamberlain from SSE and that's on the 25th uh, which is hosted by Webfleet so I just want to give that a bit of a shout out so all about finally, commercial vehicles. Yeah, so it'll be a good one. So if you, if you can't wait to the 9th um, of December, then that's the one that me and Paul will be uh, attending. So that's it from me, really. Uh, a big thank you for everybody joining today. Uh, anyone that wants to give some last words, um, go for it. Oh, Sarah's got <laughs> oh, Sarah wants to do the rest. <laughs> I didn't sign up for this for silence. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> I just think that was a really fair fight, guys. Clean, no broken jaws to be seen. Just make sure you get a drink, have some kind of relaxing massage this evening. <laughs> but I've collated the scores, and I think we'll find that blended. Oh, no, no, take it away. Back, 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 back. It needs oh, to go back. Oh, oh, it doesn't like my face. There you go. Blended is blended. I've been monitoring the chat box. That's that my. That was Matt Harris. Do you want to just ruin my life? Seriously. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> Take a point off. Take I just a point off. All the scores <laughs> off. I'm the worst referee you've ever had. I'm really sorry. DKO. It's a technical knockout. <laughs> it's a technical knockout. But in a serious way, you know I deal with infrastructure and energy in equal measure. I also deal with the consumer and I see all shapes and sizes, colours and forms. So I know that we will get to where we need to be. I also know that the power play is a, is a good debate to be having. Slow, fast, medium, everything in between, just like us all shapes and sizes. Rude. Good. Great. Great. Who wants to go next? Shall we have some final words from our special guests? Do you want to go first, Simon or Neil? I just, I wanted to come back on um, Neil's point about uh, active travel. We're, we're all for active travel, but we know from research with drivers that the car is crucial. We have 200,000 miles of roads. They're there for a reason. People need to get to places with multiple people in vehicles. Uh, busy lives, getting shopping, uh, and obviously public transport's a bit of a no-no at the moment for various reasons. And uh, just to build on that, uh, absolutely, Simon. My, my point is that hypermobility is not the answer. Um, and so decongestion uh, through smarter transport is definitely what I'm driving at. Uh, and part of that is um, not using, uh, using, sorry, using Shanks' pony when it's appropriate. Say goodbye, guys. <laughs> We're running out of time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, but um, brilliant debate today. Really loved this being about the power and not just the vehicles and the vessels, right? So, congratulations. Another string to the bow that is EV Cafe. Yes. Thanks, Neil. <laughs> Thanks, Neil. James? Yeah, just um, what Sarah said blended is splendid. <laughs> <laughs> so, as it works yeah. we've got one minute left does anybody else want to say any lasting words yes John 
I've got nothing uh, wise to say other than can we wear Christmas jumpers next time? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> So I just want to say, um, great to debate with Sam. I, again, violent agreement. Really enjoyed um, this to promote stuff. And I, I'm sure I had something else sensible to say, but I, <laughs> and um, thank you to everybody who's been involved. It's been great engagement and a real joy to be a part of. Right, on that note. No, don't end it. Don't end it. Hang on. I just want to thank everyone in the chat box. I'm on it. I'm on it. Thank you. Just saying thank you. Great. Right. I will see you on the uh, 9th of December. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. Brilliant. See you all later.